Good morning. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel in the 22nd chapter. And it's part of a whole series of the Sadducees and the Pharisees attempting to test Jesus, to trick him with their questions. Listen to God's word. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. He said, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? 
He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I must confess that I am a little bit bummed this morning. If COVID hadn't reared its ugly head, we would be celebrating Scottish Sunday together. With pipes and drums, we would be paying homage to the historical roots of our denomination in Scotland. Remembering the Protestant reformer and de facto founder of Presbyterianism, John Knox. Knox was born in Haddington, not far from Edinburgh. After being educated at the University of St. Andrews, he started his career as a deacon and then a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. And then he began to follow a preacher, George Wishart, who was touring Scotland, preaching from east to west and converting people to Protestant Christianity. Knox became the preacher's bodyguard, though ultimately not a particularly effective one. You see, Wishart was arrested in 1545 by the Catholic Cardinal Beaton, put on trial and burned at the stake in St. Andrews. This punishment so enraged the Protestants in Fife that 16 nobles raided the Cardinal's castle and killed him. In defense of the Catholic Church, France sent ships to besiege the castle. Now Knox had not taken part in the Cardinal's killing, but he approved of it. Like the book of Acts tells us how Saul, at the stoning of Stephen, quote, approved of their killing him. So Knox joined the Scottish nobles in the castle and began his career as a Protestant preacher. But the castle fell two years later, and Knox was sent, along with several others, to labor as an oarsman on a French galley. He suffered terribly for more than a year and a half before being released. And the horrible conditions on that galley broke his health, and he was sick for the rest of his life. But he traveled through England and Europe and eventually returned to Scotland, where he preached Reformed Presbyterian Christian doctrine. He was named pastor of St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Throughout his life, Knox battled bureaucrats and instituted reforms that would eventually be carried by Presbyterians here to America. At his funeral, Earl Morton pointed to Knox's grave and said, There lies a man who never feared the face of any man. He was a fierce defender of the faith, who never met a theological discussion or debate that he didn't relish. That's essentially what today's gospel is about, right? a theological discussion, a polite exchange about various ideas of God. To be honest, sometimes we discuss ideas about God and we indulge in theological discussions about God as a way of avoiding obeying God. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. Religion, you know, oh, it's so complicated, so full of conflict. There's so many Christian denominations, they all have different ideas about God. Who can ever know what's right or what's wrong? Besides, the church is full of hypocrites. And perhaps that's just what Jesus' critics have in mind. What commandment is the greatest, they ask him. Big religious question, that one. You could spend years debating the answer. But Jesus refuses to be drawn into a debate. You already know the answer to your question. It's as old as Israel. And then he simply repeats the Shema, words that everyone standing there that day knew by heart, words they repeated every day, words parents taught their children to say each night at bedtime. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In other words, love your God with everything you've got, your whole self. Then Jesus adds a second part. 
Words also known by everyone there. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The answer is simple, direct, well known. If they were hoping to get him into some kind of protracted debate where they could trap him, they weren't going to get one out of Jesus this day. In fairness to Jesus' critics, they didn't ask, you know, what is the most important belief? They asked, what's the most important command? These are Jews, after all, followers of the faith of Israel, including all 613 laws spelled out in the Torah. They know that religion is more than a set of ideas and concepts for our thinking. Religion is a way that we love God by living lives that God loves, by doing that which God loves. And that's what Jesus stresses in his response. Love God, love neighbor. It's akin to Jesus when he told his disciples, come, follow me. He didn't go up to him and say, listen, um, believe these following six things about me, or follow these ten truths. In the Gospels, Jesus calls people to a journey with him, not a seminar about him. He was a prophet preaching, always on the move, constantly drawing people into his itinerant truth-in-motion journey. He was not a professor lecturing a classroom of passive static spectators. In an essay delivered at UC Santa Barbara in 1959, Aldous Huxley said that there are two main kinds of religion. There is the religion of immediate experience, the religion in the words of Genesis, of hearing the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the religion of direct acquaintance with the divine in the world, and then there is the religion of symbols, the religion of the imposition of order and meaning upon the world through verbal or nonverbal symbols and their manipulation, the religion of knowledge about divine rather than direct acquaintance with it, information rather than formation. Religion is crowd control, if you will. For too many of us raised in mainline Christianity, the emphasis has too much been on the latter rather than the former. Way too much mind and not enough heart and soul. When Jesus does, though rarely, mention belief, he isn't talking about some kind of head trip, a set of cool intellectual propositions. He's talking about an engaging, costly relationship. Believe in me, he says, not believe in these things about me, but rather give in, be engaged, walk with me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not I am someone who tells you about some truths about the way, but I am the way. He is life. So the Gospels portray the disciples of Jesus as pilgrims on the way from here to there, having a hard time keeping up. The first disciples are not those who had the right thoughts about Jesus, but rather the ones who had the guts to get in the boat and sail with him, or to simply drop their nets behind them, even when they didn't completely understand him. So in the spirit of today's gospel, what does God want from us? Answer, to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Of course, this does not answer every possible question like, who is my neighbor or, okay, fine, but who is this God that I'm supposed to love with all my heart, mind, and strength? But it does point us in the right place. This is kind of square one for the Christian faith. Here's the greatest commandment, the most important thing to remember, our touchstone. This is the whole point of why we come together in whatever form we are able to worship, to gain the skills, the insights, the courage and conviction to obey this twofold command from Jesus. We can succeed at 
all kinds of things in religion. But if we fail at this twofold command, we're really missing the entire point. We have our marching order, so to speak, straight from Jesus, clear as a bell. Love God with everything you've got in the totality of our lives. Love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. To demonstrate our love of God in how we do our work, how we love our families, how we care for our friends, how we spend our resources, how we welcome the outcast, feed the hungry and clothe the naked, how we make decisions. And especially real for us these days, how we vote. So that all who are will be a reflection of God's loving heart within our heart. That all that we do might show how deeply we are committed to loving God with our heart and soul and mind. It's clear as a bell and hard as hell and worth our very best. Amen. Our prayer this morning is based on the psalmist's words from Psalm 90. Please pray with me. Eternal God, you have been our resting place through the ages. Generations come and pass away, but you abide forever. We thank you for your continual and unending presence among us. You bring us comfort amid our struggles, clarity where confusion persists, Offer us peace in the midst of conflict and hope of eternal life. Hear us now as we pray for your church and the needs of the world, for you are the God of all our lives. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for your church, the church that began, is maintained, and promoted by your Holy Spirit. May it be true, engaging, glad and active and continually doing your will in the world, seeking ways to uplift your people and rid ourselves of the systemic problems that plague us so that we can be fully ourselves within your world. Let your church always be faithful, ready to promote the cause of compassionate love and peace throughout the entire world. 
Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for all who govern and hold positions of power in our world. We pray for the times when policy dictates families, when decrees determine who is worthy of humanity, for the blindness that we all show when we fail to stand against policies and practices that harm your creation. We pray especially this day for those 545 children stolen from their parents at our southern borders. We pray they would find their families, that the sins committed against them and their families would be repaired. We pray for all those who make policies that lead to the destruction or well-being of your people. Soften their hearts and their vision to see what you are truly calling all of us to do. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray especially for the well-being of your people and all those affected by hunger, prejudice, war, hatred, or injustice. May we be the Matthew 25 people that you call us to be, answering the cries of those who are naked, sick, hungry, or yearning for you. We pray for peace throughout your world, a peace that is not comfortable or easy, but a peace that is true and just and equitable to all. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who find themselves alone and lonely. We name before you individuals and families who are struggling or facing uncertain future, those who are separated from loved ones, those who grieve this today, and those who are sick in body or in spirit. Hear us now as we lift up those people you have placed upon our hearts. We pray especially for Mary Roll, Millicent Nystrom, Eve Bryant, Marie Coppola, Scott Hart, Sharon Hill, Kevin Judd, Peter Oliver, Barbara Schneider, Jerry Snow, Ted Washington, and those others that we hold in the quiet of our hearts. God, we know that you hear our prayers no matter where we are. And so we offer all of these to you, using the prayer taught to us by your child, Jesus Christ, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go, my friends, love God with everything you've got in the totality of who you are and in all of the ways that you live so that God might be glorified and others might come to know the wonders of God's love for them. And remember, the God who created you and redeems and sustains you walks every day with you. Let all of God's people say, Amen.